Yeah. Okay, you want to sing with mommy? You have to look. You, you start. You start. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I sing? Okay. okay. One, two, three. Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Nice, <laughs> nice. So my wife, Mel, is one of the funnest people you'll ever meet, and it's good for me because I tend to be really serious. And something that happens frequently in our house is I'll be in one part of the house, and I will hear her just bust out laughing from somewhere else in the house. And if she keeps laughing over and over again, I know she's found something really, really funny. And that happened this last week. She had found this video. I want to show it to you guys now. Okay, we have got to show you this viral video that is making the rounds this morning. This is during a live shot on a very serious subject of North Korea, and we have all been here. <laughs> Parents, beware. Watch this. This is the triumph of democracy. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, yeah, yeah. shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> what is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Wait, wait, wait for it. Wait, um, there it is. North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea. Have been we are told. That that is the man's wife that came flying in to save the day. Oh my gosh! Any anybody? First of all, don't ever do a live shot from your home. I think we've we've learned that. Anybody with little kids can relate to this moment. You're trying to have a conference call or something, and your children saunter in with relish. I love how that little one enters the room. Yes, she comes in with complete confidence, which you expect of kids, and then the toddler comes behind, and that's, I hated those things that they would walk around. Oh, I love and those They destroyed things. everything. But to me, the story isn't the kids. It's the wife. That is a good wife she comes flying in there takes one for the team sense of urgency respect there was definitely a sense of urgency there oh my gosh and look at him he stayed trained he didn't turn around he was professional he is a professor um, of political science at, in south korea <laughs> so yeah that, that made my day and uh but you know parents uh, isn't that like your worst nightmare it's such a worst case scenario and I want to talk to you about the times when our worst case scenarios start to come true. Uh, I have this worst case scenario. It's actually a recurring dream that I have. It started when I started public speaking. And it's a dream that I'm running late and I get somewhere where I have to speak and I get up on stage and I realize I haven't prepared at all and I don't have any notes and I'm just standing there in front of a big crowd of people and I have nothing to say. It's this recurring dream that I have. We all have these worst case scenarios, right? And, and sometimes in life, they start to come true. And so the question is this, what can you do when your world starts to shake, when things start to go spiraling in a bad direction? How can you remain unshaken in a time of upheaval? And it's great that we could laugh at that guy on the TV show because he wasn't us. But when it is us, you know, how can we be unshaken when there's upheaval in our lives, sometimes it's really personal upheaval if we have a, a health diagnosis or in our relationships. Other times it's social and cultural upheaval or maybe it's upheaval at the company that you work for or the business that you started. I was talking this last week with a friend who lives in Washington, D.C. She was born there. She's lived there her whole life and she works there. And she was telling me kind of the upheaval in her life. I mean, she's looking at what's happening right now between the executive branch and the intelligence community, and she genuinely fears for the stability of society in her world and in the country. And, and we were talking, she's just in this place where everything she's seeing is upheaval, and she doesn't know how to be stable, how to be unshaken 
in the midst of that. Uh, Let's ask the question more positively. This is phrased kind of, how do you survive it? But let's ask it more positively. How could you actually thrive or how could you flourish in the middle of chaos, in the middle of upheaval, or at a time where there's just constant change? Is it possible for you not only to survive, but to thrive, to flourish, and to be fruitful? Well, God answers this question for us, and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the context of this, God kind of tells us, he says, crazy stuff will happen around you sometimes. Uh, Sometimes it's culturally, sometimes it's socially, sometimes it's spiritually, sometimes it's personally. Crazy things will happen, bad days will happen. There will be times when people lose their perspective. There will be times when people lose their morality. There will even be times when people lose their sanity. And so here's how God describes this. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. God tells us, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They'll be boastful, they'll be proud, they'll be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy in their relationship to God, without love, unforgiving, They'll slander other people. They'll live without self-control. And here's the thing. Anytime there's upheaval in our lives, it's usually instigated by other people. And it's usually instigated by people who are doing some of these things. The list continues. Let's keep reading. They will be brutal, not lovers of what is good. They'll be treacherous. They'll be rash, or that means impulsive. They'll be conceited. They'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And, and they'll have a form. They might have some religious uh, terminology or some old religious customs, some form of godliness, but they're not actually going to have the, the power of God. And in this series, we've been talking about how do we actually plug into the power of God? Now, interestingly, this is about the world out there, not necessarily Christians, But God, it continues, and he says, even within churches and spiritual communities, sometimes there will be teachers or spiritual leaders who drift away from God. And verse 13 tells us this about such teachers. It says that they will be evildoers, and they'll be imposters. They'll go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So God has definitely painted the picture for us here of an unstable shaking environment, but here's how God says you can find stability and how you can be unshaken in the midst of that. It starts in verse 15 of the same chapter. God tells us this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and what you've become convinced of. And and, and this is great for us in this series because we've learned the essentials of Christianity and this is what's being communicated in this text. Paul, a a Christian apostle, is writing to Timothy, a young Christian. And he's saying, Timothy, um, I'm about done. Paul knows he's about to die. And he says, Timothy, crazy things will happen in your life. And actually, all Christians, until Christ returns, human nature is going to continue to undermine human progress. There will be progress, and then human nature will come in, and there will be war, or other things will upset humanity. And so Christians, continue in what you've learned and what you've become convinced of. Continue why? Well, because you know who you learned it from. Uh, Timothy, you've seen in my life that this actually works. And how you've known from the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. These Holy Scriptures, Paul's now gonna expand, are what can keep us stable. Let's look at verse 16. He continues, he says, all Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful or it's profitable for teaching, not just generically, but for teaching us how to live in these times, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness or right living. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does all this mean? Well, it means very simply this. Scripture will stabilize you And scripture will strengthen you when the world around you shakes or shifts. Scripture, and this might seem like a foreign idea to you, you might just be like, that's just a big old book of old stories, right? Well, believe it or not, this book is breathed by God. 
and it's given as a gift to you to stabilize you in your life. And as a follower of Christ, you cannot be the best version of yourself. You cannot find the fullness of what God has for you in life apart from Scripture. Uh, This is the final prong on our Christian essentials. Uh, We're in this series, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, and we've been using these lyrics from the kids' song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, for the Bible tells me so. And the, the reason we've been going through this is because if you know this little song, You know everything you need to know to know the essentials of Christianity. You can carry this around with you like a little power adapter in your pocket. And whether you're on an airplane with a coworker, whether you're, you know, going into a doctor's appointment, tucking your kids into bed at night, you know the Christian essentials right here in this song. And we've been learning what do each of these words mean. And each word matters because, uh, remember in week one, we talked about tapping into the power source of the universe? How do we actually connect to God's power? And I told you about a time that I traveled and I had an American plug, but I found myself trying to plug it into a European outlet. And it was a, it was a no-go. <laughs> it, was, it was no good. And we learned that, that when it comes to plugging things into the wall, it's not complicated. Elementary kids can do it, but it is precise. You have to have the right plug. And we've learned that when it comes to Jesus and God and being made right to God, it's not complicated. Uh, You don't have to memorize the whole Bible. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to learn a whole bunch of theology, but it is precise. There are three or four key things that you do have to have in the right place in order to actually plug in to the power grid of the universe and be rightly related to God. And so here's what we've learned so far. If you've missed any of the last four weeks, we've learned about Jesus. Who is he? Well, according to him, according to his own words, he's the one true God. He's the Messiah. And that is a prong on this power plug. If you believe that Jesus is just a good man, but not God, or if you believe that Jesus is one God among many, well, that's okay. God still loves you, but you're not actually going to plug into God's salvation and his power in your life unless you believe Jesus is the one true God. That's what he claimed, and he's the Messiah. He was fully man, fully God, and he came to restore humanity back to God. Well, then we ask, when we sing Jesus loves me, what does his love mean? And again, we look to the word of God to answer this question, and when we did, we learned that God's love is not just a feeling. When we say that Jesus loves you and God loves you, when scripture says it, it doesn't just mean that he has warm feelings toward you. He does, but it's much more. He proved his love in actions, and he proved it in self-sacrificing actions, specifically by dying on the cross. Jesus, who had never done anything wrong, who had never committed any kind of sin or done anything bad, willingly took upon him the consequences and penalty and payments for all of our mistakes. And so now all of us who trust in him can be made right to God. And last week we talked about me, who is humanity. And we learned from the word of God that you, as a human being, you're different from the animal world. You have an eternal soul. You have a spiritual component to you that God calls your soul or your spirit. And it is made in the likeness, made in the image of God. That part of you will live eternally. And all humans bear the image of God. And for this reason, all humans are glorious. Regardless of their religion, even if they don't believe in God, every human being is inherently dignified and worth much to God and to us because they're made in the image of God. But we also learned every human being has been broken by sin. We're a glorious ruin, every single one of us. And we looked at those pictures of those old classic cars that have been neglected in barns or left out in fields. And because of what kind of car it is and who made it, it's still worth hundreds of thousands. Or we looked at that Ferrari, it was worth $23 million, even though it wouldn't start up. It was a glorious ruin. And it was of great value, even in its ruined state. But God loves you as you are, and he loves you so much, he doesn't wanna leave you in a ruined state. So the moment you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, not only are your sins forgiven and you're adopted into the family of God, but also God begins restoring you. 
Just like an auto expert restores a classic car, God begins restoring your soul and renewing your mind and changing you for the better. And all of us who've trusted in Jesus, until we get to heaven, we're in this restoration process. Parts of us that are rusty or corroded, uh, he's taken those parts off and he's working on them. And he's changing our habits, he's changing our relationships. Why? So that we can be the best version of ourselves. Well, this week we conclude the little song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we learn the final prong on our power plug. And the final prong is this, if I wanna grow as a Christian, if I wanna stay connected to God and I really wanna see his power change my thinking and change my habits and make me a new person, then the, the Bible is his tool for doing that. And if I will look to it as the authority for what I decide to do in my life and what I decide to believe, then it kind of keeps me in his workshop, if you will. And it keeps me where he can keep working on me. So let's look back. We looked last week, probably my favorite picture was this old Jaguar E-type, before and after, okay? So this is the car before the restoration. It's very valuable as is. A lot of the parts are under the tarp here. Um, I mean, you can see it's, it's rusty, it's neglected, the engine's out of it. It's obviously not gonna start up and drive around the block or zoom around a racetrack. But it is valuable as is because of what it is and who made it. And then we looked at the after picture. After 3,000 hours of meticulous restoration, this is the exact same car. It's the same frame, it's the same parts, but every single part has been taken off and refurbished. If it's a metal part, it's been sanded down or sandblasted and repainted or re-chromed. All the rubber's been replaced. Every single part has been lovingly, by hand, refurbished and restored. And this is what God is in the process of doing the moment you trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And it's a lifelong process. This is what we're gonna look like spiritually when we get to heaven. Until then, we're kind of in the repair shop. And the final thing you need to know if you really want to live the Christian life is that this book is what will keep you in the repair shop. And it will keep you underneath God's good and loving and knowing hands to reshape you in every way. You can summarize it this way. The same scriptures, uh, the same scriptures that led me to salvation they'll also continue reshaping me and guiding me as I follow Christ now. Does that make sense? It's the same scriptures that explain to us that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross for our sins. Now, we know those things, those things are historically verifiable, that Jesus lived, that he died on the cross. We're not only believing them because the Bible tells us so, we're believing them because they're facts but they're facts that line up with the word of God. And once we come to salvation, we start to realize the word of God is true, it is trustworthy, and if I want God to continue supernaturally changing me for the better, then I will look to the scriptures and they'll reshape me one day at a time, they'll guide me as I follow Christ. Uh, so let's dive back into our text here. And let's look a little more deeply at verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul writes to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of. And as I searched the scriptures of, you know, God, how do you want me to teach on this? Where of all the scriptures should we, should we look to? I thought, you know, as a pastor and as your brother in Christ, this is my heart for you. As many of you, have raised your hand indicating during this series that you've placed your faith in Christ. And my desire for you is this, continue in what you've learned. Okay, scripture describes us when we first trust in Jesus as spiritual infants. And when we're spiritual infants, we need to eat a lot and we start with eating the milk. And we'll talk in here right now, some of you are like, okay, the scriptures, interesting, old book, big book, intimidating book, okay? My goal for you today is to understand how you can start to feed on this book. And it starts um, just like babies drink milk at the beginning, it starts like that, and then you move up to the, that nasty puree stuff, 
you know, the baby food in the jars. And then you get to the yogurt and the pudding, and eventually you'll move all the way up to the steak if you're a meat eater, okay, and the, the thicker stuff that requires teeth, all right? So I want you to continue in what you've learned and whether you rise it or not, everything we've learned in this series has actually come from the Holy Scriptures. It's the Word of God that made us wise. Uh, it informed us what salvation is through faith in Christ Jesus. So those same Scriptures that led us to salvation, now they're going to grow us. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, All Scripture is God breathed. In other words, um, this book, it's very mysterious, but it's supernatural. And it's been breathed by God through human history and it's useful, or the word means profitable, for a number of things in your life and mine. It's useful to teach us. And this is the idea of like an elementary teacher, how they teach basic math, basic reading and writing. And the word of God teaches us the basics of the Christian life. And it starts to teach us the basics of, here's how you now have healthy relationships. Here's how you now have a, a healthy way of life and healthy habits. Here's how you can have healthy finances. It teaches us the basics. It rebukes us when we get off track and we start to go somewhere that's dangerous. You know, when, when my kids were really little, there'd be times that we're in a parking lot, especially like a busy parking lot. Like, aren't Costco parking lots the craziest parking lots in the world? We know that Satan is real and that the fall is real because of Costco parking lots, okay? <laughs> and, I, and I remember I've had times when my kids were really little, you know, and they're first learning to run and walk and they have no self-control and they're impulsive. And it's like, you look away for a second and they're darting out in front of a big Tahoe or something that are going to get run over. And, and rebuking is not an idea of like coming down. God's not coming down on you like he's mad at you, but it's like, whoa, 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 don't go there. That will destroy you. That will destroy your relationship with your kids. That will destroy your marriage. Don't go there. And when we're reading the word of God and opening our hearts to it, it, it corrects us like that. And also, it trains us in right living. And the idea here is it allows you to function as you were designed to function. You remember with our car analogy that when one of those classics had been neglected in a barn, its engine couldn't start up and it couldn't drive. As it gets refurbished, it can now do what it was designed to do. And here's the thing, as a Christian, as you follow Jesus and you read his word and you allow the word of God to reshape you, it trains you to actually live as you were intended to live. And so it starts to change your life in every dimension, in your relationships, in your thoughts, in your habits, in what you do with your life, and you can start to race again. You can start to do what you were designed to do, and it's so fulfilling. It's where you find your purpose. Well, all of this works together so that you will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this takes us back to where we started. In a world that is shaking and shifting and sometimes crazy and dangerous and unsettling, God wants to make you stable, but even more than that, he has good works for you to do. He wants to make you fruitful. He wants to make you a light in the dark. He wants to make you a place that when all your coworkers are unsure and insecure because the whole company is shifting, it's like, Wow, why is she so confident and stable? And, and, and God's going to use you in your environments and in your life, but how he's going to use you is as you submit yourself to the word of God and allow it to refine you and to improve you. So let me give you some um, specific pictures of this. And the first one is, uh, I've worked on a, a few different cars, and I've usually found myself in a position where I start off without a repair manual because I think I can figure it all out. And then I'll get to a point, uh, not on every car, but on some cars, you get to a point where it's like, what were the engineers thinking? There's no way to get this part off or there's no way to reach in there. And finally, you surrender your pride and you look to the repair manual, okay? And the repair manual is great because it's either written by the people who designed the car or by others who've completely taken it apart and put it back together. And it tells you step by step, here's how you remove that part that you can't get off. 
And what's great about a repair manual, a number of things. First, uh, if you get the specific one for the exact car you're working on, it tells you if you're restoring the car, here's exactly what to take off and here's exactly what to put on. And scripture does the exact same thing. There are passages of scripture that say, you know, take off sexual immorality, take off lying to each other, take off greed, and take off filthy language from your lips, and put on gentleness, put on kindness, put on self-control. And so just like a repair manual, the word of God shows us what needs to change And just like a repair manual, it shows us a picture of once you get everything restored, here's what it will look like. And that's really helpful. And God has given us a picture of that specifically in Jesus. When you read the Gospels, we know Jesus was sinless and and he is, he's what a human looks like when they're fully restored. And so we can look at how Jesus treated people and we can look at how Jesus prayed to the Father and say, oh, that's, that's what I'm going for. That's, that helps me in my journey. Repair manual is also helpful because sometimes you know what to do, but you don't know how to do it. And that happens in the Christian life. It's like, okay, I know that thing is not good for me or anyone I love, but I don't know how to get that out of my life. Well, look to the repair manual. The repair manuals are also good because they're thick books and they assure you, and this is good for those of you who are a little perfectionistic, a restoration does not happen overnight takes years and years and years. If you're working on a car by yourself, it takes a long time, okay? And until you get to heaven, you are a work in progress. So when you find another area of your life that's a little bit corroded, you find some sin, you find some ugly stuff, don't get depressed, don't get down on yourself. The repair manual assures you uh, none of us get fully restored overnight, okay? It's a work in progress. Let me give you another picture of this. Uh, of what does the Word of God do in our lives. And here's a picture of a good old-fashioned printed on paper map or road atlas. I have one of these in my car uh, for the day that the internet, if the internet ever dies, I have an old good old-fashioned map in my car, okay? Now here's the thing with a map or if you use an app and you follow the turn-by-turn directions, you're trusting the person who put this together. You're trusting that they were experts and they knew what they were doing. And so Uh, you use, you follow those directions. And, you know, even if you feel like, well, my gut really tells me I should go this way, but if the map is clear and you know you're following it, you know this will actually lead me where I want to go. And that's how it is with the Word of God in our lives. There's times that we think, boy, you know, I really want to go right, and God's telling me to go left, and it's very clear. And here's the thing, you can trust the Word of God. In fact, because of the ruin part of us, because of the depravity part of us, if you really want to transform, you've got to choose, I'm going to trust this more than I trust this. I'm going to trust God's heart more than I trust my heart. I trust that he's bigger, he has a bigger view, and he knows me, and I can actually trust him and his guidance for my life more than I trust my own feelings, which change from day to day and season to season. Well, did you know that when an NFL quarterback runs out onto the field that they're actually carrying a book with them? Uh, it's true. They carry this thing called a playbook. Most of them carry it on their wrist. It's a, it's a little wristband, and it's a summary of the most important plays that the team has. Here's a picture of a playbook in action. You can see it on the wrist of this quarterback. And if you were to zoom in on this picture, you could actually see uh, dozens of plays. Why is this? Well, here's the thing. When a team goes out onto the field for a game, they don't know exactly what's going to happen. But they do know that their strategists and their coaches have thought of a play for anything that could happen. And so when they go out there, they don't know exactly what's going to happen, but they know that they have a playbook that will instruct them. And here's the thing, when you go out into life, when you start a new week of work and you go out into life, you don't know what's going to happen. But in the Word of God, you have a playbook that has thought of every scenario you can think of. Last night after the message, a a woman came up. She's a brand new Christian. She's growing in her faith. And she said, I'm really growing, but my husband's not a Christian. I'm not sure what to do. Guess what? 
There's a chapter in the Bible that talks exactly about what to do if you're a Christian and your spouse is not. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And here's the thing. No matter whatever comes your way in life, culturally, financially, socially, personally, health-wise, there God has written a play for you in here. But just like that repair manual, just like the road atlas, and just like this playbook, it is not going to do you any good if it's closed and sitting on the shelf. If you're working on a car and you've got the repair manual, but it's closed and on the workbench, it's not actually going to benefit you. And God encourages us to open the scriptures and open our hearts to them, not to earn our salvation, but to continue the restoration that he has begun. And it's for our benefit. It's for our good. It's for our restoration that we open up the word of God and we open our heart and say, God, reshape me today. Reshape my desires today. Well, here's the good news. In a post-truth world, and we talked about this week one, that not Christian researchers, but secular researchers have concluded that we now live in a post-truth society. That is a society that defines truth not by facts, but by feelings. And as a result, truth is always changing. And as a result, a lot of our neighbors are very insecure because what can you count on anymore? Here's the great news as Christians. In a, in a post-truth world, we have an unchanging guide, a reliable guide. It's been proven for thousands of years. And it leads us to a fullness of life. Here's the thing. This is not some rule book that constrains your life and makes your life boring. This is the path to freedom. This is the path to fullness of life. And God desires to navigate you through the rubble and the brokenness of the world. And sometimes it's a narrow road, but it leads to wide open spaces where you have peace and you have joy and you have healthy relationships. It doesn't mean you never get sick or have problems, but internally you have this supernatural peace. You're a different person. It's a fullness of life and it leads, as we've learned, to eternal life. When our bodies wear out and die, then we get to wake up in heaven and get the final part of the auto restoration. You always do the body last. And that's how it works with us spiritually as well. God's got new bodies waiting for us. I've seen the difference of this and I have to be careful because I could talk about this all day <laughs> because this is what has changed my life. I mean, it's Jesus and it's his power, but it's as I've actually very imperfectly, but pretty consistently tried to say, okay, God, with my marriage, with all my desires, with my career, with my finances. If you say go right, even if I feel like going left, I'll, I'll go your way. If you say go up and I wanna go down, I, I'm gonna, and God knows I'm imperfect at it, but it, you just try to be consistent. And you, and you decide kind of once and for all, when me and this book disagree, this book's gonna win. And, and I've just seen it in my life. It's made me a totally different person. And I've seen it in so many of my peers. The, the people and the couples and the groups of people who say, we're going to do what this says, they experience the power of God. And the people who say, yeah, it's just myths, or notice this, even Christians, Christians who've placed their faith in Jesus, but they never open this and they never adjust their life according to these directions, they miss out on this fullness of life. Because just like a repair manual or a map, it's there. It's there for the using. But if you neglect it, it's not gonna bring about the change in your life that it could. Well, I love taking walks, and I, I grew up by a lot of lakes and rivers in Michigan, and I love walking by rivers, and I've been walking lately around the creeks here because they're all flowing after the rain we've gotten. And I've noticed something when I walk by rivers or lakes or creeks that there's always these giant trees right at the edge of the water. Anyone else ever notice that? I mean, there's these huge trees right at the edge of the water. Uh, do you know why this is? I mean, all trees need sunlight, but if you go to the desert where there's a lot of sun, you're not going to find a lot of big trees. The reason you find big trees by the water is that trees need water. It's like their power source. And a, a tree like this, it's, it's perfectly located because with all this water here, you can see its roots its roots are reaching down into the water. And this is how God describes his word in Psalm chapter one. He says, blessed 
is the person who delights in the word of God. A blessed is the person that when, they, when they're not sure what to do, instead of you know, looking to Facebook or looking to their own feelings or calling up a friend, the person who searches the word of God and says, God, what do I do? Says that person who delights in the law of the Lord will be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. That person, their leaves will be green and not wither. That person will bear fruit in season. I have seen this in my life. And here's the thing. Paul's writing to Timothy in our text, 2 Timothy 3. And Paul's at the very end of his life. And he's like, Timothy, I've taught you everything I know. Now here's the most important thing. Here's the last thing. All scripture is from God and it is useful and profitable. It will teach you, it will correct you, it will rebuke you, it will train you in righteousness. In other words, everything else you need to know is contained here. So this is the final prong. Dig your roots down deep into it and it will shape you. It will make you your best version of yourself. When I choose to feed on it and submit to it, God's word does a number of things in my life. One, it protects me from evil. There's times where you'll have desires that just like the apple back in the Garden of Eden, they look really good. But if you follow that desire to have an affair with your coworker, it will destroy your relationship with your kids. It will destroy your marriage and it actually leads to death. And so it's God's word that says, As strong as your desire is there, don't go that way. He protects us from evil when we open our hearts to his word. He guides us into life. He transforms us for the better to be our best versions of ourselves. Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to the shape of this world. Everyone's living out of their glorious ruin mixed nature where sometimes they're doing the right thing and other times they're doing the wrong thing. And You don't have to be like that. You can be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we renew our minds? It's it's right here. One word at a time. And finally, the word of God, it restores me to be what God actually designed me to be. Well, here's a question. Have you known this? For some of you, this is brand new. Others of you, you have known this and you've had seasons of life where you've tasted it. But maybe you've kind of gotten away from the habit of consistently feeding and drinking the Word of God. I want you to know that you can begin experiencing this today. And I want to tell you something really practical. I mean, here's how to do this, okay? Because this is something a friend told me a long time ago. It was early in my spiritual journey, and it totally changed my spiritual journey, my relationship to the Word of God. Um, I was kind of intimidated by this big book. And uh, a friend told me, John, here's what I do in my life. I have a journal. And I went out and just got like an unlined little art book. And you could get one with lines, whatever your personality is, okay? And you just write the date, okay? You write the date, and then under it, you write um, where you're going to start reading. And let me say this. Start reading in the Gospel of John. And once you, as you go, eventually you'll get to the end of the Bible, you're in what's called the New Testament. There's two halves. I would encourage you, just hang out in the New Testament for quite a while. Keep reading the New Testament. The Old Testament has a lot of stake in it, but until you really get your teeth and your teeth are strong, there's some things in there that you might kind of choke on at first, okay? So, so start, start in the New Testament. Uh, there's two right, great places in the Old Testament. There's a book called Proverbs, And um, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. So every day you can read the proverb for whatever date it is. You know, just look at your watch or your phone, the date, read that chapter of Proverbs. That is milk. That is not steak. And it's awesome milk, okay? Um, And the book of Psalms is another really good one in the Old Testament. But other than that, for now, start in the New Testament, okay? Start with the Gospel of John. Okay, here's, I want to take the pressure off your shoulders. You don't have to read a chapter a day. You don't have to have some... Um, just generic goal of I have to read this much. Here's what you do. You read until something makes sense in your life. Okay, just read until something makes sense in your life and then stop there and and taste the flavor of it. And so what I do is I write uh, the date, I write the chapter, you know, where I am, and I just read until something makes sense and then I actually write that verse out. 
So let's say the verse is, uh, flee youthful lusts, and instead pursue righteousness together with those who call on God from a pure heart. Okay, that's something I can work on today. Like, that's something I can take with me out into the world. So I just write down that one verse. That's it. And then underneath it, you, you write a prayer to God. God, today, will you help me to flee youthful lusts? And will you help me to pursue righteousness? And this says, together with those who call on you from a pure heart. So help me to find a group of people that, that I can have community with who help me do that. And you just make that your prayer. That's it. You're, you're done for the day. Because now you just kind of take that with you. And as you go out in the world and you're seeing things and you're feeling things, the Holy Spirit will bring that back to your mind. Oh yeah, flee that, pursue this. Okay, and now here's the thing. If you're a night owl, you can do this at night right before you go to bed. If you're a morning person, do this with your coffee in the morning. If you're neither, you can do it on your lunch break, okay? But you try to find a day, a time of the day that consistently, this is gonna be my life rhythm. I'm always gonna do this around this time. And here's the thing, when you open up the next day, you just look back at yesterday. Okay, yesterday, what did I learn, Lord? Oh yeah, flee youthful. Oh, Lord, you know I did not do a very good job of that. Please help me with that. And, and then you just read again until something makes sense. And here's what will happen. You'll have days that you look back at yesterday and it's like, boy, I didn't, I read that in the morning and it made sense and by the time I got to work, I had totally forgotten it. But then you'll have days where it's like, whoa, I actually remembered that until lunchtime. And then you'll have days where it's like, whoa, I remembered that, I remember that like all 24 hours, I, I, I remembered that. And some days, you know, it's always, remember, the restoration takes process, takes time. So, but here's the thing, that what you're doing, what I just explained to you is you're learning to feed yourself the word of God. And just like a baby learns to start feeding itself, you'll get stronger and your teeth will start to grow and you'll be able to eat a little more and you'll be able to chew a little more and get more flavor and more nutrition out of the word of God. But it starts right there and I just wanna encourage you, it's not impossible, it doesn't have to be so intimidating. For me, it really helps writing it down because then I can review it again the next day and you don't have to read a whole bunch. You just read until there's something that makes sense in your life. So God's word is practical and it directs us. But I want you to know also that God's word is very personal and very emotional. And I actually saw a story that illustrates this really well. My wife and I were watching this TV show called This Is Us. And I wanna tell you this story that happened in an episode recently, and here's the family that I wanna tell you about, okay? I'm gonna tell you a story about William, who's the grandpa, and Beth, who is his daughter-in-law. Now, here's the thing. William and his son had been estranged. The family had never known William. He had given his son up for adoption. The son finds his dad about four months before the dad is, is gonna die. The dad has cancer, the, the grandpa, okay? So the grandpa moves in with this family, and the, this son is working a lot, these girls are in school, and so what happens is because Beth is a homemaker and William is in their house, they end up spending all day together every day for like four or five months. And everyone knows that William has cancer and everyone knows he's dying, but he's, he's this really endearing, kind, and gentle man. And he and Beth start to develop this really close one-on-one -on -one relationship. I mean, Beth starts telling him things she hasn't told anyone uh, because he's just there and he's a good listener and he's so kind. Well, what happens is that William knows he's dying and he kind of knows he's just got about a week left, but he doesn't tell everyone. He says goodbye to those two little granddaughters and he kind of gives a, a really meaningful goodbye to the little girls. And then with the son, he takes the son out on a road trip and he gives the son a really meaningful goodbye and then he dies. And what happens is at the memorial, Beth stands up and she's talking about how great he was, but she's like, really, I'm mad at him. I'm mad because he knew he was dying and he gave such a meaningful goodbye to my daughters. And he gave such a meaningful goodbye to my husband. But I feel left out. I feel kind of angry because he never said goodbye to me. He never spoke that word to me. I wonder, do you ever feel like God has forgotten you? Do you ever feel like he's given other people a really special word, but not you? 
Do you ever feel like he hasn't thought of you? If that's you, I want to encourage you to open your eyes and open your heart to the word of God, and you'll find that it speaks directly to you. See, here's the beautiful thing about that episode. After Beth is so upset, a few days later, she's checking the mail. And in the mail is a postcard. And it's a postcard that William had gotten when he was on the road trip with his son. And in that postcard, it wasn't to the family. It wasn't to everyone. It was just to Beth. And in that postcard, he wrote very personal, very emotional, very specific words about his one-on-one relationship with her. And as Beth realizes as she reads that, I wasn't forgotten. He did think about me. He did have a word for me. She kind of clutches that to her chest and her eyes well up with tears. And here's what I want you to know. I haven't lived forever, but I've been through some crises and some difficulties. And here's what I have found. If I will clutch this to my chest, I will hear my father speaking to me. If I will open my heart and be real and say, God, here's where I'm frustrated. Here's where life doesn't make sense. Will you speak to me from your word? I have learned that he always has a personal word for me. He always has a deeply emotional and specific word that actually makes sense in my life. And here's the thing, I can rewind in my life I mean, I can take you visually to these places where I would meet with God. And in every season of life, he's always been there with me. I mean, I could take you to a specific mountain in Phoenix where I'd go up there as the sun was setting and I'd take a little lawn chair and I'd take God's love letter to me and I would just journal about what's going on in my life and he would speak to me and I'd watch the sunset. I I could take you to Riversides in Michigan. I could take you to libraries in South Carolina. I could take you to bagel shops in Manhattan. I could take you to creeks right here in this area. Everywhere I've ever gone, even when I'm alone, my father goes with me and he speaks to me and he guides me and it's practical and it's helpful, but it's also deeply emotional and it's affirming and it tells me who I am and why I am and that I'm safe in that I'm secure. I've held on to God's word when I haven't known what to do in my marriage, when I haven't known what to do in my career, when I've been paralyzed by fear of failure, when I've experienced failure, when I haven't known what to do as a dad, when I've been trapped in sin, when I've been apathetic. I mean, every season of life you can imagine, he's always been there and he's always spoken to me. And here's what I want you to know. No matter what season you're in today, your father wants to speak to you. And it's because we love our God that we love his word to us. Because we love our God, we love his words to us. He has spoken specifically to us. And can you be a Christian without reading your Bible? Well, yeah, technically, I mean, you're adopted into the family of God. There's nothing you can do to get out. You don't have to read your Bible to stay in the family of God. But do you want to have a tight, growing relationship with your father that makes you the best version of yourself? Then the more you love him, the more you'll begin to love his word. And you can start with those little baby nibbles that we talked about, okay? It doesn't have to be intimidating. You don't have to be perfect at it, but just... Be consistent at it, just like eating food. Well, I want you to know, whatever season of life you're in right now, that God does have specific wisdom for you. He knows the challenges you'll face today, and he knows the unforeseen challenges that you'll face tomorrow. He's anticipated them, and he's written to you a wise and practical love letter, a roadmap, a repair manual to guide you through anything that this life will throw at you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Can I pray for you? Oh, Father, thank you for loving every one of us individually and specifically. Father, I just wanna thank you that the Bible, it is a love letter. And I wanna thank you for how you express your love to me one day at a time when I open those pages and when I open my heart to it. And I just pray across this room, Lord, that we would be a people 
who commit to your word because we're committed to you. That we would be a people who love your word because we love you. Lord, this final prong for us to plug into your power in our lives. Jesus, we believe you're God. We know you died on the cross for our sins. We've placed our faith in you, and we thank you that you are restoring us every day. And Lord, finally, we surrender to your word, and we ask, will you help us to get into the habit of feeding on it daily so that we can be restored and renewed and reshaped from the inside out? We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.